Um, before I start, I'll just pray. Uh, thank you, God, for this day and that we can um, come here and worship you. And I just pray that as I um, uh, speak your word, that you would help me um, to give the right words to speak and that um, as we go away from today, we can apply um, these words of John to you in our lives. In your name, amen. Okay. Um, so I'm going to be talking on um, 1 John uh, chapter 2. Uh, verses 17 to 27. Oh, oh actually, verse, it's not verse 18, but whatever. So, children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming, so that many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are all are uh, not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you have heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing you have received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as you have taught you abide in him. So here, John starts off declaring that it is the last hour. So what is the last hour? Hasn't there been many hours since the Bible has been written? Firstly, the Bible talks about the last hour as a new era. The coming of Christ brought in this new era. Now that Christ has come, all that was left was the end of the world. So this can be shown in a few passages. Um, so the first passage is in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 2. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets and many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and whom also he has made the universe. So the writer to Hebrews is saying that in past ages, God spoke through prophets like Daniel, Daniel and Isaiah. But in this age, that being the last days, God has spoken through Jesus, what Jesus did and said. It's also shown in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, where it says, These things happen to them as an example and were written down as warnings for us, on whom the culmination of ages has come. Here, Paul claims what happened in the past is a warning for those of us who live in this age, that being the last days. Finally, in at Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, verses 14 to 17. <laughs> when Peter stood up with the eleven, he raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are, are not drunk as you suppose. It is only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in these days. And they will prophesy. I will show wonders in heavens above and signs on earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious days of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
So here, Peter is talking about Joel's prophecy, in which, which is about the last days. In the last days, God will pour out his spirit on all his people, causing them to see visions, dream dreams, and they will prophesy. Peter is claiming that this prophecy came true at Pentecost, where God's spirit was poured out on the disciples, some of whom spoke in tongues and others who prophesied. Peter is saying that Pentecost is in the last hour or days. So, firstly, the last hour is an age. Secondly, the Bible talks about the last days as a time before the second coming. This time could be long or short, and when it ends, it will end suddenly. During this time, people will wonder if Jesus is really coming back, as he promised. Peter describes this in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 to 10. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their evil desires. They will say, where is this coming he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it is since the beginning of creation. But then deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters, also the world of the time has been deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. For the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. This passage shows that we are now currently living in the last days or last hours. The reason for this is that firstly, many people in today's society scoff at the idea that Jesus is coming back due to the myriad of failed prophecies. Secondly, they either do not believe in God or are apathetic to God and have forgotten that he made the world and will destroy it again. Moreover, God is demonstrating his patience by waiting at least 2,000 years, allowing many people from all lands, tribes, and people to be saved. So, we are in the last hour, that is the time after Christ and before the second coming. Secondly, John asserts that we know that it is the last hour, given that many antichrists have come. So who or what are these antichrists? And why do they demonstrate that we are in the last hour? In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, Paul discusses the coming of Christ, which is the end of the last hour. Here he says, Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask, brothers and sisters, <coughs> not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching <coughs> allegedly <from coughs> whether by prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's <coughs> temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things. And now that you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who holds it back will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie, and all the ways the wickedness deceive those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. 
For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe a lie, and so that all will be condemned who have not believed in the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. So here, Paul warns the believers in Thessalonica that Jesus won't come until a man of lawlessness is revealed. This man, while doomed to destruction, will set himself up as God. Doing so by setting himself up in God's temple and being worshipped by people as God. Moreover, he will perform many signs and wonders. Many people see this man of lawlessness as the Antichrist that is mentioned in 1 John. Even while this Antichrist hasn't been revealed, his power will influence people. So Jesus also talks about what will happen in the last days. In Matthew 24, verses 3 to 14, and also in Mark 13, 3 to 12, he said, it says, As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. They will de deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased and the love of many will grow cold, but the one who the endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So the last days, according to Jesus, will be marked by several things. These include false or antichrists, false prophets who can do signs. And after these things, Jesus will come back. So in both these passages, we can see that before, in the last hour, an antichrist or antichrist of some form will appear. Thirdly, in 1 John, John describes how we can know who or what the Antichrists are. In verse 22, God, John states that the Antichrists are those who deny that Jesus is the Christ by saying, Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. How are they denying uh, so? father and son so how are they denying that jesus is the christ are they denying that he is the messiah this would seem odd as they are christians coming to a church rather it seems that they are denying that jesus came in the flesh that is they accept that he was god but not that he became human um, this can be seen clearer further in 1 John in 1 John 4 verses 1 to 4 where it says dear friends do not believe every spirit but test the spirits to see whether they are from God because many false prophets have gone into the world this is how you can recognize the spirit of God every spirit that acknowledges Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you've heard is coming and now is already in the world. So here John gives a way to test a spirit, including teachers and false spirits, whether they're an Antichrist or whether they're from God. The test is relatively simple. If they believe that Jesus has come in the flesh, they're from God. The reason, oh, they're from uh, yeah, so yeah. The reason that this was a problem in the early church was that the Greeks 
believe in a strict form of dualism. Dualism, dualism is a philosophical system which believes that there is a spiritual realm and a human realm. Both of these are strictly divided. The spiritual realm is good and the human realm is bad. Um, <clears throat> and those who had, who had a true understanding of the world and who, had, who were seen as having a higher form of knowledge or a secret wisdom in the Greek world were those that who knew that there was enmity between the spiritual and the physical. So here John is refuting this idea. He is saying that the spiritual Jesus became flesh. The reason why this is important is for two major reasons. Firstly, if Jesus um, came in the flesh, then the Christian faith is a matter of history. That is, Jesus actually came and there are historical facts to verify that he lived. Secondly, if Jesus was not human, then he didn't really die, and Christianity is false. So, how do we combat these Antichrist lies? John answers this in two ways. Firstly, in verses 24 and 25, in which he says, let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. So firstly, he calls us to anchor ourselves in the historical faith of Christianity. That is, look to the, to the Gospels in which it describes how Jesus lived and how he died. The reality of his actual human birth in which he had a real mother, how he lived in the world, ate real food, and thus was physical, and died a real death. Secondly, he offers um, a second solution in verses 26 to 28, where he says, I write these th things to about what you, uh, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as the anointing teaches you about everything, and is true, and is no lie, just as is taught, abide in him. Here, we are to abide in God. You've all been given the same anointing by the Spirit of God. We do not need a special charismatic teacher to give us special wisdom or special knowledge. This does not mean, though, that we do not need teachers and preachers. Rather, it means that we don't need to look out for special knowledge, that we just need to abide in God. So, while, so what about now? Now, most people do not deny that Jesus was a human being. In fact, 52% of the American adults believe that Jesus was a great teacher but they also believe that he wasn't actually God. I suspect this is for many reasons. Firstly, most of society these days have a poor understanding of Christianity. While they know that Jesus is a central figure of Christianity, they do not know that he is God. Secondly, second, secular culture has played up the morality of Jesus' teaching, saying he is similar to Buddha, and other teachers. Um, and finally, some former Christians who are academic in nature want to keep the important secular elements of Christian teaching, that is to love your neighbor and other important things, but want to abandon the theological realities. As we've seen in this text, in the early days, it was obvious that Jesus was God. And the question was, whether he became human. So, much like previously, we need to stick to the teaching of the Bible in which it talks about his deity and his humanity. Secondly, we need to abide in Jesus and not abandon the faith.